Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, today begins a new chapter in, I know, I know, it's dramatic, isn't it? Uh, a new chapter in our classroom training wherein we actually create something new. So, like a chapter? Like a chapter in a book, say. Um, yeah, so hands-on training is the undisputed champion of how to learn things in our trade. Um, unlike Mike Tyson, am I right? right. <laughs> Come on, Come you know? On, I mean, you clearly won, but you got to finish the thing, you know right. what I'm saying? Don't pull. <laughs> all right, that's enough. Uh, yeah. All right, okay. So, good. okay. So, we need more hands-on training. We need more hands-on training even when we're in here, but the trade in general needs more hands-on training. The problem with a lot of hands-on training is that some people get hands-on and then other people watch. And that's not that helpful. So we want everyone to get more hands-on training and I also want you to think, um, I just want you to think, period. No, I want you to think uh, more deeply about the things that you're doing. I want you to be challenged uh, when you are learning rather than being fed things by me. So we are going to develop a platform for the industry. Um, the one that's in the back of the classroom is the first model built by Bert and Ryan and Corey. Um, but we are going to improve upon that design iteratively, which means slowly, step by step, improve upon the design until we... Hey Aaron, how's morning, things? Morning. Yeah, good to see you buddy. Uh, until we have come up with a good platform that can be easily replicated by us and also by others. Um, so, objectives. Objectives are that our goal, objectives are that our goal, that is redundant as heck. <laughs> wow. Our, our objective is to use a window unit, a very inexpensive window unit, the most inexpensive window units that we can find. They can be easily purchased at your local Home Depot, Lowe's, or on this new little site called Amazon.com, which is where we purchase these three. We can use these components and reconfigure them in multiple ways in order to uh, demonstrate the basic refrigerant circuit, in order to demonstrate electrical, uh, in order to uh, then continue to reconfigure them in order to do things like refrigeration, starting with high temp, medium temp, and then going into low temp. Um, and be able to do things like refrigerant cycle testing, evacuation, recovery, uh, again, like I said, electrical diagnostics, but then even just wiring it up yourself, um, changing fan speeds in order to change condenser airflow, evaporator airflow, add restrictions into the circuit, change metering devices, all those sorts of things that we do on a regular system, we can do on a smaller unit like this. And the question may be, why would we bother to do that when we have perfectly good full-size units. The reason is, is that with perfectly good full-size units, A, they're expensive, B, they're 240 volts, and, uh, and C, I can't think of a C right now because I don't have it written out. One person at a time. You don't want to break it. What's that? One person at a time. Mm -hmm. One person at a time. That's what it was. That's what it was going to It's one person at a time. So uh, there are labs out there. Uh, and God bless them, where they've got you know 20 sets of identical equipment so that everybody can work on their own unit throughout a school year, that's great. Most people don't have that, including me. So even though I have a really nice lab up at Lake Tech and it's got really nice training equipment, um, those early stages where you don't feel great about throwing somebody on a you know $50,000 piece of training equipment and just saying, hey, there, have at it, um, you can easily do it with a small window unit. And so, this is the challenge that I want uh, us to rise to here at Kalos is yes, we're going to tear them apart because we're going to learn and put them back together, but we're also going to tear them apart and put them back together so that way the industry can come up with a better way of doing this so that anybody can easily produce, if they're so inclined, uh, their own training equipment so that every student can have their own unit. That's the goal rather than having, or a team of students. And in this case, we're gonna start with teams uh, until we can kind of establish our, our system. 
So any questions about that before I go on? No, we don't even have an official name for this yet. Um, we could call it the uh, universal training platform, something like that. Um, and I'll go into a little bit later some specific things uh, that we definitely want to do with it. Um, we learned some things in building this first one uh, that I think are going to uh, kind of instruct how we build the, the next ones. Uh, but there are some, some other things that I want us to do rather than what we did over there. But the goal is to make this work very much like a residential standard system rather than a window unit. So we don't want to have, you know, the kind of some of the goofy ways that window units are built. We want it to be uh, built more like a regular unit so that it's serviceable and that sort of thing. Now, before you all fall asleep, what do you think one of the big challenges is with working on a window unit rather than a typical unitary split system? Accessibility. Space. Space, right. So it's hard to, it's hard to get in there. It's, uh, things are smaller. So that's one of the things we want to do is spread the components out so that way we can actually access the lines in between and we can actually work on it more easily, which is uh, what we did with the first one. What are, what are some other challenges that you face with working with a window unit? Are there service ports on it? Are there service ports on it? That's another good question. No, there are not service ports on it. So that is, a, that is something we have to overcome, and we'll talk about that quickly. But what else? Type of refrigerant. Controls. The controls are different. That's a good one. Type of refrigerant. That's a good one. So type of refrigerant and quantity of refrigerant are probably the two biggest challenges. And so these come with a factory charge in them. Anybody care to tell me what the factory charge is on the, on the data plate there? Obviously, they come with a factory charge in them. That was sort of a ridiculous statement. Not so much. I know you had it on there. R32. Yeah, R32. All right, and how much? How much? Oh, it's right here on the side. What does it say? 6.17 ounces. 6.17. R32. 6.17 ounces. Now, there are rules in the U.S. about how much of this type of refrigerant can be in the equipment. I'm not even going to quote it right now because it looks like it's going to change very, very soon. And it's not the sort of thing you're going to memorize anyway. But the point is, is that this type of refrigerant is a flammable refrigerant. More specifically, it is what is called a mildly flammable refrigerant. It is an A2L. So if you think of you know, the letter number designations, um, A refrigerants are non-toxic. We pretty much only work with non-toxic refrigerants, pretty much. Um, residential like commercial, you're only gonna run with, into A refrigerants. And it used to be that we would only be working on A1 refrigerants, which means non-toxic, non-flammable. Whereas now, we're seeing a lot more A2Ls and then even A3s. So an A3 would be like propane or isobutane. Those are called hydrocarbons. So this R32 is an A2L refrigerant. Uh, refrigerants like R290, which would be the most common A3HC, which stands for hydrocarbon. And so, this is what we got, and this is, an, this is a hurdle that we're going to have to face when dealing with small window units nowadays. The smallest, least expensive window units nowadays, and this is very recent that this started happening, come charged with R32. That's the bulk of them that you're going to buy nowadays. Um, the one that we have in the back, that one came charged with R410A. Now, it would be great if we can find them with our R410A, but what we got is R32. So we need to talk about some best practices when servicing something that has a flammable refrigerant. Now, if it was propane, um, we would have some uh, disadvantages and some advantages. What's the disadvantage to propane compared to most other refrigerants? I already said it, but it's flammable. It's flammable, right. It's very flammable. It make fire real easy. Now, good thing about R290 R is that it's a very good refrigerant. Good thing for R32 is it's a very good refrigerant. Pretty low pressure. R32 is more like R410A, but our propane is more like R22. 
So they're easy pressures to work with, nothing crazy, carry oil pretty well. Um, so they, they work nice as far as refrigerants. Downside is flammability, right? Now, good thing about R290 is you don't have to recover it. You can vent it, which is kind of cool, right? You don't have to have recovery equipment because a lot of people ask that. Well, is your recovery machine rated for hydrocarbons? Is it rated for R290? You don't have to recover it. So the downside, of course, is, is that you wouldn't want to dump R290 inside of a restaurant or something like that, which right now that's where you would find most of that equipment. So it's flammable and you don't want to just vent it inside of a restaurant. So let's just think quickly, see if we can use our common sense. Let's say that you're working on an R290 appliance. You need to get the refrigerant out of it safely. You're in a restaurant. You don't want to use your, your recovery machine. How would you get it out without risking anyone's safety? How big is the... Uh Piece of equipment. Well, I mean, you're limited by charge anyway, so everything's going to be under a pound. Oh, I mean, like, is it a double door, or can we wheel it outside? Yeah, well, so that's one thing. If you can wheel it outside and vent it there, great. That would be your first thing. What if you can't? Long hose. You can use a long hose, right? That, you, that, that could do it. Now, some of it's going to be left in the hose, so think about that. Short leak and a lighter. <laughs> what? <laughs> Short leak and a lighter. No. That's a bad idea. I don't like that idea at all. That's a terrible idea. I'm sorry that you just repeated that in front of everybody. Um, another thing you could do is you can take a large recovery tank that's empty, you can pull it down into a deep vacuum, and because of the large internal volume of that tank, you'll often get all of that refrigerant out before that tank even hits atmospheric pressure. Again, it depends on how much refrigerant and size of the tank, but that's a good technique you can use. And in fact, that's the technique that we're going to use on these. I'm going to pull a big tank down into a deep vacuum. And I, again, I haven't done it before and I haven't done the math on it because math is so boring. There's no such thing as a deep vacuum in our world. <laughs> Bert says there's no such thing as a deep vacuum in our world. We're pulling it down below atmospheric pressure, below 14.7. And uh, I'm quite certain. It's called a good vacuum that that pressure differential will draw all of that R20, R32 into the tank. Um, now, good news is our recovery machines will work with this R32 as well, an A2L. Now, I haven't seen that they're rated for R290. I would doubt that they are. But again, why would you recover R290 with a recovery machine currently? There's not enough of it for that to be a sensible thing to do currently. Um, but with these, we do have to think about not having an open flame near uh, any, any even residual. We don't want to have an open flame near these refrigerants. Okay? So like when you're, after you've recovered it, you're going to want to purge it before you try to braise anything. Correct. Indeed. Indeed. So, in terms of how you would do that, you would use a pinch off tool like this, generally speaking. And again, I don't know if this has processed stubs on it or not. <laughs> oh yeah. Yep, we've got a little, got a little process stub thingy here. This is a, just like an end seal off. And so you can put your pinch off tool where the pinch already is. You can cut the tube, and then you can put a stub on it. Now you know how I just said you don't put an open flame anywhere near it. You actually do when you're putting, when you're brazing in your Schrader port. So you would crimp this on, then you'd cut it, and you'd make sure that it's not leaking at all. You know, use, use bubbles, whatever, to make sure that there's no leaks coming through, and then you would braze your port on. And that's where you definitely don't want to, you know, burn through it. Then you take your, your crimper off and you just kind of crimp it back the other way just a just a touch. Because again, you're not you don't need a ton of flow through it, just enough to get the charge out and get a new charge in later. Does that make sense? Does everybody see this here? We can do B-roll on this later if we need to. But so you take this. Just crimp it down. Make sense? Once you cut this, you'll see if any's leaking out or not. And that's a pretty standard way of doing that. Now you can use, they make piercing um, tools as well. In this case, the tubing is so small um, that a lot of times the piercing tools are actually going to collapse. Now you can use a saddle valve, take the saddle valve off, and those will work okay. I think we, we had some sitting around here recently. but. 
Um, but generally speaking, this is your best bet because now you've got a permanent port attached here. Now, in this case, since we're gonna be completely disassembling it, a piercing tool, uh, one of the ones that are really designed for smaller lines, uh, would probably be your best bet. Again, we noted when we were doing a ton of recovery on um, some sealed condensing units that you have to think about where you use those piercing tools because they tend to actually collapse the line. I'm talking about the ones that use the, um, the vice grip style. Whereas the saddle valves um, that are specifically designed for it, uh, they, they work pretty well. They do tend to leak though, so yes. <laughs> they do tend to leak. Um, in terms of what you do before you actually put a torch on it, um, if there's any residual, you would definitely flow a lot of nitrogen through it. So you'd first get the refrigerant out. R32 is a regulated refrigerant, so you do have to recover it. But that's where my suggested method would be negatively pressurize a tank, um, you pull a vacuum on it, you gotta pull a vacuum on the tank anyway before you use it, and then just hook it up and um, do it that way. And you can actually pull the vacuum all the way on the hose, so take a, take a hose with a ball valve on it, pull the vacuum all the way down, shut the ball valve, then hook the ball valve up, open it up, and pull that refrigerant out. That would be my suggested method. Now, in terms of um, once you've already got that tank under positive pressure, now you're not gonna be able to do that anymore. If you wanna put more in the tank, then you're gonna to have to use a recovery machine. Now, with the, with the charge that's this small, a recovery machine is gonna be, you know, it, 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 most of that refrigerant is gonna end up in the recovery machine. Now again, the field piece machines that we use, um, I haven't looked on the NAVAC machine, but I'm sure that it as well, are specifically rated for A2Ls. Does everybody follow what I'm saying here? A2L, that's what this has in it, R32. 6.17 ounces is what it's got in it, and that is that mildly flammable refrigerant. So it's not, it, you know, like we're playing it up because you want to be really safe. It's not gonna like cause a bomb or anything. It's not like you're gonna be working on it and the thing's just gonna explode in your face. Um, if you were working with R290, you would need to be certainly more careful about that. Now, a lot of people will say that you need a new vacuum pump to work with A2Ls or R290, and that's just not true. Um, I, again, the, if you had left a lot of residual refrigerant in the equipment, then maybe. But that, that's where flowing a lot of nitrogen while you're working, purging nitrogen through, uh, and, then, and then pulling your vacuum. Because you have that, um, that lower flammability limit where you have to have enough of the fuel in order for it to really be flammable. Um, as long as you follow good practices, you're gonna be fine. In terms of suggested practices, they're going to also tell you that you should not leave any ports on an R290, a flammable or mildly flammable system, because ports can leak, and so you want to leave the system completely sealed. Again, most of the guidelines are going to tell you that. Now, in our case, we're not going to put R32 back in these systems, because that would just make our life difficult. We're going to put 410A back in the system. Um, which means that it won't work as well as it was designed to work, but we don't really care because in this particular case, this is for training, this isn't to make an efficient um, unit. Now, does anybody know why they went to R32 versus R410A? Any thoughts on that? Anybody know where my coffee went? I'm not sure, it's over there. You're doing that Up thing. Top, top behind, your, <laughs> behind this one. It is right here. <laughs> there it is. Oh, it's more effective. Oh, my bad. <laughs> see That's everybody's Jay favorite joke. It has a lower GWP than R410A. That's the reason why, generally speaking, people are going to R32. But they've been using R32 in developing countries for a while. What's GWP? Global warming potential. Global warming potential. Oh. But you knew that. You're just you're just joshing Is that us. A real thing? Yeah. I re okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, That's one of those no-win conversations that I just don't have anymore. All right. Let's fight about this. Yeah. Let's. So, global warming potential is a big reason, but also R32 is a better refrigerant. It's just better in terms of its um, latent heat of vaporization. It, how much of it you have to move in order to do the job of cooling. Uh, it's a better refrigerant. In fact, it's one of the best refrigerants. Its downside is that it is mildly flammable. And this whole mildly flammable thing, that's a new term. They used to just call it um, 
I forget what the A2s were called. It's, it was like mid flammability or something like that. It's not, it wasn't mid flammability anyway. We can find it, but um, they made the category A2L specifically so that people would be less worried about using um, some of these refrigerants that really aren't that flammable. They're not flammable like propane, but they are still flammable. So R32 is a great refrigerant. There's nothing, there's no reason for us to be afraid of it so long as we follow proper practices. Um, it is coming and it will probably be in unitary equipment. It's probably one of the refrigerants we're going to keep on our truck very soon. Um, Daikin is already talking about uh, using R32 in the U.S. as their replacement refrigerant for R14A. Carrier R has decided on a different refrigerant and I always forget what it is. R4... 1234YF is, our, is being used in cars and some small equipment. Um, it, it's not the one that's going to be used in split systems though. Expensive. Yeah, it is, it is pricey. Uh, so R32 in terms of its um, similarity to R410A is nice. In terms of its uh, latent heat of vaporization, it's nice. Uh, its downside is its, is its mild, flamm mild flammability. Um, because R410A is actually 50% R32, 50% R125. So what we don't like about uh, R410A, what makes it not a great refrigerant is the fact that they add this R125 into the R32 and mix it together in order to make it uh, an A1, in order to make it not flammable. But R125 is not a good refrigerant, it's a very good flame retardant. So they put that in there in order to keep the R32 from, from being flammable. So in terms of this first project, um, we have to think about the flammability. Again, nitrogen is your friend. Make sure that it's all out before we proceed. Uh, we want to put the ports on it. And today, the main thing that we're going to do before you all leave is, uh, Jesse's already looking nervous, so it must be a busy day. No, no. Okay. <laughs> the first thing you're going to do before you leave is we're going, to develop our, we're going to develop our three teams and we're going to come up with a game plan. Um, because as we go in these classes, we're going to keep coming back to these same units and we're going to pick up where we left off. Um, and we're going to keep building on it until we got three different, they won't be identical, I don't want them to be identical, three different versions that then we can hopefully take what we've learned and build it into one really good prototype that hopefully we'll have available and ready to uh, present by the time the symposium comes up in March. So by then hopefully we'll be able to have instructions written and have the images and kind of show step by step how we did what we did. Make sense? That's the goal. And we're just going to keep doing it here. Every, every time we have a meeting or class, we will have meetings about other things that we can add on to it, whatever. But we're going to come back and we're going to work for a little bit on these units. Um, then we can go away, gather up more materials, whatever we need, and then come back the next week and work on it a little bit more. Any questions about that? All right. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.